we're just making a brew up now using the old hobo stove and if you want any uh, tutorials on hobo stoves and how to make one have a look online because I know I've got a video or two on there it's a nice day Brocolitia, meaning badger holes at modern day Carobra, was built sometime after the construction of the wall. It was the first infantry fort on the wall's central section and was to become the barracks for a succession of auxiliary units. The fort was first excavated in the latter part of the 19th century by a Northumberland lawyer called John Clayton. Clayton's partial excavations unearthed the remains of a military bathhouse outside the West Gate, the Southwest Interval Tower, and Coventina's Well, a shrine to a Celtic goddess. In 1949, the exposed tops of three shrines led to the discovery of a Mithrian temple, followed a decade later by the discovery of another shrine, this time dedicated to a local water nymph, And close by to the temple and shrine, it's believed there also existed a small vicus. Mithra. God born of rock, watch over us this day, for there in such defiance do they stand, the enemies of my emperor, the painted barbarian warriors of Brittany, who have resisted the might of Rome. This was their land, but here we stand, soldiers of the Second Legion, battle forged and ready to fight for the glory of Rome. Mithra, if this be the day, then lead those of us who fall to where the great bull dies so we may feast with Saul until it is time for us to sleep. It is thought that Mithra was born on the 25th of December, emerging not from the womb, but from a rock. Already in his youth, and clutching a dagger in one hand and a torch in the other. It is believed the Mithrian cult was practiced by Romans from between the first century BC up until the early part of the fourth century AD. Mithra, whose origins may be Persian, was a deity much favored by Roman soldiers and auxiliaries. Although having a cult following, Mithra was very much a part of the accepted pantheon of Roman gods and his followers thought of him as fulfilling various roles. He was seen as a guardian angel, a guide of human souls, a mediator between the worlds of consciousness and unconsciousness, the link between the living and the dead, and he would also light the way for your safe passage into the afterlife. A major ritual was a reenactment of Mithra's act of Tauroctony, the ritualistic slaying of a sacred bull which took place in a very deep cavern, the bull forming the main course for a feast to be shared with the sun god Sol. Mithra also seems to have been favored by other gods within the pantheon. The dagger he uses belongs to Saturn, the god of agriculture, liberation and time. The caduceus used to light the fire at the base of the altar belongs to Mercury, messenger of the gods guide of the dead and protector of merchants, shepherds, gamblers, liars and thieves. And as with any deity, it always pays to make a, a little offering for a fair and safe journey. Well, there's my offering. Make sure it were worth it. My votive offering to Mithra, and of the water nymph, I call upon an echo of the past, 
to briefly invoke her name and memory. Sildenea, daughter of Corobus, spirit of the spring pool. I have returned. Though how quickly has a cycle of seasons passed me by, ravaging this body you once caressed within your cold embrace. Look upon me now, Sildenea, for I was ever the mortal. Now my eyes grow tired and dim, and soon they shall know a sleep from which there is no awakening. Yet as I kneel beside you, I know them to be the windows into a mind of knowledge and wisdom only ever gained through the journey of life. So why do you now hide behind my reflection? Yes, Sildenea, you are capricious by nature, a true nymph of the waters. It has to be noted, whilst General George Wade's construction of Military Road back in 1748 had a destructive impact on the remains of Hadrian's Wall, were it not for John Clayton's passion for Roman military archaeology, it has now been recognised that little or nothing of the wall would remain today. Such was the demand for stone to build mills, mines and factories during the height of the Industrial Revolution. Today. John Clayton is viewed as one of the single most important individuals in the history of Adrian's Wall. From Broccolidia we head towards Vercovicium, where we hope to find somewhere to pitch camp for the night. As for the weather... We're sheltering from the rain, pouring it down. It's early June. 2012, and as Newcastle experiences some spectacular lightning storms and other parts of the UK are being hit by flash floods and tornadoes, we're being treated to some very impressive and dramatic weather conditions of our own. With the storm heading towards us, we calculate a safe distance from nearby trees, then pitch camp for the night. Morning. Well, it absolutely threw it down last night, but there's an advantage to that. Burkovisium is the next ford along Hadrian's Wall. However, leaving it behind for a moment, we head off a few miles southwest and on towards Vindolanda. And here we are at Vindolanda. Now, if you're ever going to visit Hadrian's Wall, although this isn't part of the fort structure of the wall itself, it's set back a couple of miles. You haven't visited Adrian's Wall if you don't visit here. Vindolanda forms part of a fort-based defence system which predated Adrian's Wall. This earlier series of forts were linked by a military road which today we call Stangate. That's not to be confused with a military road built by General George Wade back in 1746-48. The Stangate, which means stone road in Old English, became the new frontier after the Romans withdrew from Scotland in 105 AD. 85 AD saw the first of five phases of turf and timber fortifications 
at Vindolanda. It wasn't until AD 160 that the first of two phases of storm-built forts appeared, the latter phase being the remains of what we see today. At Vindolanda, excavations are going on more or less all the time. These are barracks which have recently been excavated. These stone-built barracks are similar to those reconstructed at Arbiaya. So this is a barracks where the auxiliary troops would have resided. Eight to a block, and this is one block here, they would have slept together, or at least slept in the same room, and done a cooking in this next room here. Quite luxurious for the time. However, it was during the excavation of the barracks at Vindolanda that a rather gruesome discovery was made, for in the corner section of one block, archaeologists unearthed human remains. Bound at the wrists, these bones belong to a young 12-year-old girl, and how she came to be buried here is a mystery. It is believed that her death and burial took place in the 3rd century AD, during the time when the 4th cohort of Gauls formed the garrison. Burials within built-up areas were strictly forbidden during Roman times, suggesting she may have been murdered. However, Roman forts were manned and guarded 24-7, and each barrack cell was occupied by eight men who formed a contiburnum. These men would have been a tightly knit single unit. They would have served, fought, and lived together. They may even have suffered all the same punishment if any had committed a misdemeanor or crime so our young victim may perhaps have been a slave who died viciously at the hands of an auxiliary soldier but was quickly buried by the men within the contiburnum in order to hide the crime and avoid collective punishment. Her eternal sleep has been disturbed. How long has the earth gently wrapped her within its cold embrace? What stories would you have her tell? Look upon her, for she is placed between the world of now and that world of long ago. The world in which the gods saw illuminated the days through which in life she walked. For all she may reveal unto you be content, for there are many things about her which shall forever be lost in time. Could you even tell me, by what name was she known? <laughs>